This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. Violent crime, political unrest, financial instability. Everything points to an impending crisis, a crisis like no other. Tune in to World's Last Chance Radio to learn how you can spiritually prepare for what lies ahead. WLC Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's imminent return. Hello and a very warm welcome to our listeners. We're so glad that you could join us for another programme on World's Last Chance Radio. I'm Mars Roby, your host, and joining me is my very good friend, Dave Wright. And hello to you, and thank you very much for making us a part of your day. We always look forward to this hour every day when we can spend time in Yar's Word, learning and sharing truths important to know in these last days. If you've joined us before, you know that we like to start with a very quick word of an explanation for our first-time listeners. On WLC, we feel privileged, I would say, to know the personal name of the creator, which is Yahuwah or Yah. It's been lost in our modern translations, where it appears under the generic title of Lord. We don't like to use Lord when referring to the creator because there are so many. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul says, For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, or theos in Greek, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord, Yahushua, the anointed, by whom are all things, and we by him. El Eloha and Elohim are Hebrew titles, and they're used throughout the Old Testament. They refer to Yahuwah and are often used with the divine name. In the New Testament, Jesus' name is actually Yahushua. Some people say Yeshua or Yeshua. That's fine. Different languages find different sounds easier to pronounce, but the full name is Yahushua. One reason we always take the time to offer this explanation is because Scripture repeatedly urges believers to call upon the name of Yahuwah. In the modern translation, it says, call upon the name of the Lord. But the original says, call upon the name of Yahuwah. This is important. What gets lost when titles are used is the true meaning of the divine name. The father's name comes from a Hebrew verb of being Hayah. What's so beautiful is this, you know, the root word for the father's name was used throughout the creation of our world. Light be, light was. Yeah, the same power that spoke the universe into existence is contained in the word of Yah. So when you say the Father's name in combination with your need, it becomes a powerful promise you can claim by faith. And that's what it truly means to call upon the name of Yahweh. With the events that are going to be taking place between now and the Saviour's return, it's important to know these things because at some point we're all going to be brought into an impossible situation where only Yah's power can deliver. And if we haven't made it a habit to call upon him now, if we haven't learned to trust in him when things are going well, we're much more likely to cave into pressure then. It's important to know so we can start making it a habit to call on the name of Yahuwah. Absolutely. Now, today we're going to be talking about what potentially is the most important topic you'll ever hear us discuss, at least important in terms of its impact on other lives, and that is parenting. How do we raise our children for Christ. If you don't have children of your own, this still applies to you. There are children and young people all around. We have a responsibility 
for nurturing these younger members of Yar's family. So today, I've asked Dave to share with us some practical pointers on how to raise spiritually-minded children. Dave. I like how you said that, Miles, actually, referring to the children and youth as the younger members of Yar's family, because yeah. that's precisely what they are. Absolutely. A parent's job is the most important work in the world. We are quite literally raising the next generation of citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And how we influence them, how we train them, has very far-reaching effects. I don't think we realise that enough, though, or at least act on that truth enough. Abraham Lincoln was President of the United States back during a horribly turbulent period of the 1860s. He was widely known, even among his political enemies, for his high moral character and, most especially, his honesty. Yeah, didn't they give him the nickname Honest Abe? Uh, yeah, yeah, actually, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, he didn't have the most stable upbringing, but he did have a dedicated mother. Lincoln said something once that really demonstrates the power of effective parenting. He said, quote, all that I am, or hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. Another time he wrote, quote, I remember my mother's prayers, and they have always followed me. They have clung to me all my life. Oh, that's lovely, isn't it? Isn't it? Both mothers and fathers have a very long-lasting influence on their kids, both for good and bad, of course. The good news for us, though, is that for every little effort we make to raise our kids right, Yah will bless and magnify our efforts. He knows we're trying to raise them for him, so he'll send angels to work with us and bless our efforts. Is there a particular philosophy of parenting that you find especially good or helpful, Dave? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, there is. It's more of an analogy than anything, but let me share it with you, and I think you'll see the value in this illustration. Okay, well, what's that then? Well, it's the analogy of a garden. Oh, yeah, I've heard that. Children are flowers in the garden of life. Well, actually, no. I, I oh. mean, that that's true, <laughs> yes. But the analogy is comparing a child's mind and character to a garden. Okay. Now, if you want a beautiful garden, what's the first thing you do? Uh, you have to get the ground ready, of course, and get rid of all the weeds. Yeah, you pull out all the weeds, all don't the you? Weeds, yeah. uh, now, this is where a lot of parents stop. They see a weed in their child's character garden, and they're very good and very diligent about pulling it. They keep a close watch to make sure no little weeds rear their ugly heads. Mm. But tell me, if all you ever do is pull weeds, are you going to have a, a bountiful, flourishing, beautiful garden? Uh, probably not. The <laughs> best you'll probably just have a mud patch. <laughs> exactly. Yes. It takes more than weeding, of course, to grow a beautiful, productive garden. It also takes planting. You have to actively nurture what you do want. Mm. You see, this is where a lot of parents fail. Sure, weeding is an ongoing part of being a parent. But if you want your child to have the beautiful flowers of kindness, courtesy, patience, you're going to have to train that into them. That's a very good point. Babies aren't born automatically knowing how to be polite, are no, they? No, uh, nor are they born automatically to, say, have a good work ethic. Mm. If you want your children to grow up to be polite, kind, honest, hardworking, contributing members of society, then you're going to have to actively train them to be that kind of person. I remember when our first child was born, it was my mother-in-law that said it was important that we raise him to be the kind of person we wanted him to be as an 18-year-old. Yeah, you know, that's another good way to put it, actually. And these principles hold doubly true if we want to raise our children to be spiritually minded. How many conservative Christian parents do you know whose kids end up turning their backs on their parents' beliefs once they're grown up? Uh, too many, too many. I want to spend the rest of our time today focusing on some specifics. How do we raise children to be spiritual, committed to Yah adults? What are the seedlings we plant in childhood that will bear a bountiful harvest in adulthood? The first, I'd say, is prayer. Pray for and with your child. You can even pray for them while they're still in the womb. Years ago, we had a friend who said that she had dedicated her middle child to Yah before it was even conceived and that she'd always noticed a distinctive difference in that child's spirit and attitude as compared to the other kids. Yeah, that's great to hear that. It really is. Prayer is powerful, of course. It oh. changes things. If you want to raise your child to be spiritually minded, you need to teach him or her how to pray. 
and not just by example, although of course that's important too, Teach your children to pray so that they can always have that one-to-one connection with Yah for themselves from a very early age. One thing I'd like to share here is that I think it's really important to teach our kids to pray to the Father. We pray in the name of Yahushua, but we pray to the Father. How many kids are taught to pray, dear Jesus, dear Jesus this, dear Jesus that, you know? They grew up hearing about how much the Saviour loves them, and he does, of course, They grow up singing, Jesus loves me, this I know. And that's all great. It's all true. But the problem is they grow up feeling an attachment to Yahushua whilst Yahuwah becomes this scary, shadowy authority figure for whom they feel no real emotional attachment other than fear. And at best, all they have is uh, an intellectual knowledge that Yah loves them. At least they've been told that he does. But they have no real Um, heart connection to him when the whole focus is on Yahushua. Yeah, you know, Mars, that's a really good point, actually, and it's very insightful. You're absolutely right. It's important to remember that the Son came to show us the Father. He never intended to usurp the Father's place in our hearts. This is especially important in broken homes, I think, or situations where there's an abusive authoritarian father figure. We men have got to realise that we stand in the place of Yah to our kids. Both parents do, really, actually. Well, yes, but especially fathers by virtue of the fact that we're all, well, fathers, you know. If we're always strict and stern, never loving and understanding with our children, that is going to shape their view of their Heavenly Father. How can it not? If we tell them their Heavenly Father forgives their sins, but then if we, their earthly fathers, turn around and yell at them for making honest mistakes or having accidents or even making poor choices based on their youthful lack of experience, what does that say about their Heavenly Father? It says that he's just like Dad, Dad. that when they (laughs) sin, he'll get angry with them. You're right, yes. It is a solemn responsibility. We're going to take a quick short break. Okay, but when we return, (laughs) I want to expand on this point a bit. Absolutely. We'll be right back. Many people have been appalled and confused by passages of Scripture where Yahweh commands the total destruction of entire peoples in the conquest of Canaan. Such mass genocide appears to conflict with other passages of Scripture that present the Heavenly Father as kind, just and infinitely loving. There is a reason for it, though and this reason is consistent with the Father's character of love. To learn more, go to worldslastchance.com. Look for the documentary Nephilim in the Bible. You can also look for it on YouTube. Parenting is both the hardest and the most rewarding job in the world, but it becomes much more solemn when we realise our responsibility before Yah in raising our children to be members of his kingdom. Dave? I want to talk a little bit more about being our children's role models. Now, we can say all we like, don't look at me, I'm not perfect, but they are going to look at us. We're the authority figures in their lives. How we treat our children is going to impact them, and it will shape their mental image of Yah. Yeah, or it's saying, don't look at me, I'm not perfect. It's, it's an easy out, isn't it? Listen to this. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Paul says, Imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. So yeah, our kids and others do look to us. We need to take responsibility for that and act like it. Yeah, you're right, we do. Any parent who's ever hit his thumb with a hammer... You know that, been there, and oh, yes. blurted out a bad word just to hear their little darling then repeat it oh, over and yeah. over and over again. You know that children learn by example. Mm. And this is both a good thing and a bad thing. In my personal opinion, and based on my own observation, this is the single biggest reason why children turn their back on their parents' teachings. Why do you say that, though? You know, we just got through saying parents should teach by example. Yes, but how many of them are consistent? How many of them Mm. live what they teach? This is so utterly crucial to raising spiritually-minded children. Take, for example, the movies. 
A parent can preach all they want about a wise use of time, keep our focus on yah, they can quote, by beholding we become changed. But if, say, dad wants to watch the latest Hollywood blockbuster action movie full of violence, crude humour and nudity, what's the child going to remember? The actions rather than the words. Now, I'm going to say something that I've kind of been hesitating whether I should say or not. I don't want to be misunderstood, and Mm. not everyone may agree with me on this, but... We'll just say it, Dave. You can always take it back later. (laughs) All right, then. Here it is. Uh, In my personal opinion, and you are free to disagree with me on this, but it's my personal opinion, if a parent has a bad habit he doesn't want to give up, if she has some pet sin she secretly wants to cling to, they would be better off not teaching the child the higher standard at all, rather than teaching a high standard but living a double standard. Based on my observance, this is the number one cause of why adult children turn their back on their parents' teaching. Yeah, I can see that. At least if if nothing is taught at all, it leaves room for the spirit of Yah to convict the child's heart. But if the parents' actions contradict their teachings... What gets tossed out are the teachings rather than the actions, yeah? The actions are copied. precisely my point. Okay, but we don't want to take this too far. What about in cases of addiction there where mummy can't seem to give up smoking or daddy's a struggling alcoholic? What about then? Well, I agree, and yeah, this is a bit different. If a parent has an addiction problem, it should be explained to the children what addiction means, using words appropriate for their age level. This has even more force if the explanation comes from the parent who is struggling to overcome the addiction. All sin is addictive, but certain addictions, such as drugs, alcohol and nicotine, cause a psychological dependence in the body or the brain chemistry that is not the same thing as being convicted to give up worldly pursuits, but just not being willing to do so. Yeah, I I get that. I do. When one or both parents have a life that is inconsistent with what they teach, the vast majority of kids will turn away when they've grown up. That's why I say it's better for parents to say nothing at all than to live a life that's inconsistent with their teachings. At least that gives the spirit of Yah room to work and convict the child's heart. Otherwise, the danger is that the grown child will throw it all out in disgust. That kind of reminds me, actually, of something that uh, Yahushua told the disciples. Just give me a quick second to turn there. It's in Luke 17, verses 1 and 2. It's, here we go. Uh, Then he said to the disciples, It is impossible that no offences should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck, and he were thrown into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. That's how important our example is. How much influence our lifestyle choices really have on others. Not just our own kids, but others too. Now, while you've got your Bible open there, Miles, could you just turn to Matthew chapter 19 and read verse 14 for us? Yahushua said, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Let the little children come to me. Allow them. It's like he's saying... They'll come if you don't turn them away. Yeah. And one of the biggest ways we keep them away is when our own lives are not consistent with what we say we believe to be the truth. One good thing every parent can teach, by example, is the fact that truth always advances. We're not supposed to settle back, twiddle our thumbs and announce that we've got all the light necessary for salvation. As we study scripture, our understanding will grow. And as our understanding grows, we need to share these new beliefs with our children. And that's important. I know at first I I was a bit worried presenting new ideas to my kids. My wife and I had studied them out. Sure, we were convinced, but we were a bit afraid that if we told our kids that something we taught them was truth, was actually error, we were afraid that they, I don't know, have some mini crisis of faith and just throw it all out. But that didn't happen. It wasn't as upsetting to them as it was to us to learn that we'd been believing error all these years. No, and it's not going to be. Kids are used to learning new ideas. It's part of childhood and youth. It's only when we get out of school that we think we've arrived and don't need to learn anymore. But if one of the basic principles you teach your kids is that they have responsibility before Yah to keep studying, to keep learning truth, because truth always advances... 
then when you need to adjust, they won't have any problem with that. And that's good. So they just grow up with the understanding that you keep learning more truth all life long. Right, exactly. Well, how can you get your kids into the Word? I mean, there are a lot of adults that don't like to read their Bibles. How can we get our kids into it then? Well, to answer that one, the younger they are, the easier it is. Now, you're right, of course, a lot of adults don't like to read their Bibles either. It's boring. If you feed yourself a steady diet of novels and worldly distractions, you're not going to be hungry for the word of Yah. Mm. And I've noticed, though, that the more that you read, the more you want to read. It's like, um, it's like a form of dehydration. You know, a person who's chronically dehydrated doesn't even feel thirsty anymore. But if he starts drinking and giving his body adequate water, he'll start to feel thirsty. Yes. And I've noticed that in my own life, too. OK, for getting our kids into the wood, again, the sooner the better. We lead here by example. They should know that we have personal morning devotions. We should also have morning and evening family worship. Doesn't have to be long. Most people's mornings are rushed and by evening we're all tired. But setting aside time together as a family is important. Pray together. Sing if you can. Read a bit from scripture or an age-appropriate worship book. Don't make it some glum, solemn affair. The closeness the kids feel during these times they will associate with Yah. I think it's really great if fathers will lead out in morning and evening family worships, but often they don't feel comfortable doing so. Ladies, if you're raising your kids on your own or if you have a husband that doesn't want to lead out in family worship, don't feel as though you're taking the lead on this somehow makes it less effective. It doesn't. Anything we do as parents is only effective as Yah blesses our efforts. You being the one to lead out in family worship is just as valuable and important. It's just as influential as if your husband did it. Well, look at Timothy. Let's read, in fact, Acts chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Timothy was a devout young man, even though he grew up in a divided home. Now, you've got it there, Miles, yes? Uh -huh. um, go ahead for us. Then came he to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there, named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Obviously, there were plenty of Greeks who were believers, but from the way this was phrased, we know that Timothy's father was not one of them. Years later, near the end of Paul's life, he wrote a letter to Timothy in which he said, quote, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. So these women, two women alone in a real sense when it came to Timothy's spiritual upbringing, were extremely influential. Because of their godly influence, Timothy was able to join Paul and became a powerful leader in his own right in the early church. I never want a mother to feel that her efforts to lead out in family worship don't count because she's a woman. Ideally, both parents should be involved and equally committed to raising godly children. But we don't live in an ideal world. You can be like Lois and Eunice. You can be like Hannah, who raised Samuel so well that when he was only 12 years old, Yah spoke to him. You're not the first woman to have to carry that burden alone. And ultimately, it's Yah who blesses our efforts anyway. Our part is to cooperate with him. I recently read a study I found very revealing. Lifeway Research released information about this study that was called Best Predictors of Spiritual Health Among Young Adults. You want to guess what the number one factor was in raising a child to be a spiritually minded adult? Uh, praying then? Teaching them to pray at a young age? Nope. Although, actually, that was fairly high up. Uh, bringing biblical lessons into daily life. Actually, that one there was quite far down the list. Which, oh. When you factor in how many of us say one thing, but then, by our example, demonstrate another, yeah. it's not all that surprising. No, the number one factor in raising a child to adulthood who was spiritually devout was the child regularly reads the Bible while growing up. 
For himself? For himself, yes. Wow. That made it twice as likely the child would remain in the faith as an adult as any other contributing factor. Now, the way that we do this is, again, start young. When our kids were little, my wife and I would get up early so we could have our own personal devotions. By the time the children were three and four, though, they were starting to wake up earlier. After coming for good morning hugs, we would send the children back to their rooms. This was their quiet time with Yahweh. And by this age, they already knew how to pray, so they'd say their own little prayers. Then we had some things available that they could use in their own quiet time. They weren't old enough to read, but we had some Bible picture books and other things they could use. Like what, though? Uh, well, we had some cassette tapes, if you remember what they were, that really? they'd listened to. Uh, shows how long ago that was, doesn't it? <laughs> the tapes had Bible stories on them. These were some that we bought, but of course you could always make recordings of your own for your own children to listen to. Now, obviously for a young child, this is going to be very short. No more than five to ten minutes if you're lucky. But it does get them in the habit at a very young age of beginning their day spending time with Yah. For older kids, there are other things available. If they can be given their own Bible, that's best. By the time our kids were reading, they had each got their own Bible. There are also resources available on our website. For kids who speak English or who are learning English in school, they can listen to the John Bunyan classic Pilgrim's Progress on our website. It's got actors and sound effects. It's actually a really lovely production. It's worth having a listen to it. Mm, okay. And the spiritual lessons are really deep. and I, I do enjoy listening to it as an adult as well. Yeah, exactly. And one final thing just to add at this point. At evening worship, spend a few minutes recounting the blessings of the day. This will help your kids get to know Yah. Blessings recognised and acknowledged awaken love in the heart. Love increases trust. Raising kids for Yah doesn't happen by accident. It takes deliberate thought and effort to produce a bountiful garden in their characters. Teach them how to pray and claim Yah's promises. Teach them memory verses. Most importantly, though, make sure that your own life is fully surrendered and consistent with what you're teaching, and Yah will bless your efforts. You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio on WBCQ at 9330 kHz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Shortly before his death, the Saviour foretold that all who follow truth would be persecuted for their faith. Revelation also reveals that in the near future, man-made laws will seek to usurp the divine law. Romans 13 is one passage of scripture that will be used in the future to coerce Christians into obeying human laws in violation of the divine law. If someone tried to compel your conscience by quoting from Romans 13, saying that the powers that be are ordained by Yah, how would you answer? What would you say? For a clear understanding of the true meaning of Romans 13, go to our website, worldslastchance.com, and read The Believer's Civil Duty. Again, look for The Believer's Civil Duty on worldslastchance.com. Valeria Gomez from Coloma, Honduras has sent a question for our Daily Mailbag today, Dave. Ah, now then, did you know that the name Honduras literally means great depths? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, why did they give their country the name of great depths then? Well, that's where Christopher Columbus first set foot in the New World. Apparently, once he got to shore, his first words were, thank God we got out of these great depths. Ah, yeah, I probably feel that way too, to be honest, after sailing off into the unknown. Anyway, uh, Valeria's question is one I think we can all benefit from. So she writes, How do you witness to sceptics? So often they ask questions that I don't know how to answer. I know we're supposed to be able to give an answer to everyone who asks. But how? Sometimes it seems like they don't want to be convinced. They just want to argue. Well, I think you're right, Valeria. Often they truly are not interested in learning the truth. They just want to argue. So, by way of advice, know your audience. Don't get drawn into an argument just for the sake of arguing. Mm. No souls are ever won to Christ that way. 
That said, though, a lot of times people who are sceptical are open to being convinced. They may even want to believe, but their doubts or questions are stumbling blocks standing in their way. I think now, more than ever, as tensions in the world increase, people are looking for answers. They're hurting. Now, if we can offer them answers, honest answers, they may very well be open to learning more. And the first thing that you need to do, of course, is pray. Always pray and ask for divine guidance. You can dart a prayer heavenward asking for wisdom. You can also make it a part of your morning devotions. That's what I like to do, to be honest, Dave. You know, in the morning when I pray, I ask Yah to send me opportunities to witness for him as I go about my day. I like that. You know, those opportunities might still be there, to be honest. But if I pray and ask, he impresses my mind to know when to speak and what to say. I'll probably miss out on a lot of them otherwise because, you know, I wouldn't recognise these openings for what they actually are. Yeah, and, and when you make it part of your daily morning prayers, you can also pray ahead of time, asking Yah to prepare the listener's heart to be open to what you have to share. Questions from sceptics all tend to sound the same after a while, to be honest. For example, one I hear a lot is, if God is all-powerful, why is there so much suffering in the world? Yeah, that's a very common one, that is. Yeah. Uh, another one is... Um, what do you do about all the contradictions in the Bible? Like I said, they start to sound alike after a while. <laughs> yeah. So do you have any responses you can suggest for the most common questions skeptics ask? You know, For example, what do you say that can appeal to the mind of a skeptic when he or she asks, if Yah is so powerful, why does he allow suffering? Yeah, that's a question believers and non-believers alike frequently question. And it is actually a fair question. The truth is, the Father suffers even more than we do. And just to prove that, can you turn to Hebrews chapter 4 sure. and just read verses 15 and 16, please? Okay, it says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The Father and the Son feel everything we feel. The Father, because of his infinite nature, suffers even more. He suffers with me. He suffers with you. He suffers with a child on the opposite side of the world we don't even know about. If he were selfish, He'd call a halt right now because it would end his suffering. We can't blame Yah for the suffering in the world that is here because of sin. Life in a sinful world is going to be full of suffering. That's exactly why he never wanted us to experience sin. But he will never force the human will. He guarantees everyone freedom of choice. Yes, that means that sometimes good people suffer because of the actions of others. But even in this, we can trust the Father. Romans chapter 12 verse 19 counsels, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith Yahweh. We can find that concept in Deuteronomy as well. Uh, just let me quickly find it here. It's Deuteronomy 32, chapter 32, verse 35. It says, to me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. So even though there is suffering in the world, we can trust the love of our Creator. The only reason He allows this is because He will never force His will on others. However, even in suffering, He can bring good out of it. Can you read Romans chapter 8, verse 28? Oh, I knew you were going to say that. I love this one. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love Yah, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Another question that confronts believers is, well, what about all the contradictions in the Bible? Yeah, I've heard that one before as well, Dave. One thing you can do is ask for specific examples. A lot of the time, people don't know of any. They just make that accusation because it's something they've heard mm. and it agrees with what they want to believe. There are, however, a couple of principles that you can share with them. The primary place people accuse the biblical account of being contradictory is in the stories of the life of Christ. 
Oh, yeah, well, four Gospels, four accounts of the same time period. Differences will crop up. The thing to remember, though, is that omission of a certain detail is not the same as a contradiction. Um, For example, then? Well, take the Gospels' account of the resurrection. Luke chapter 24 refers to two angels at the tomb after the crucifixion. Matthew 28 only refers to an angel. Now, if he specifically said there was only one angel, it would contradict. As it is, a casual reference to an angel can be reconciled with Luke's account. Another point is that just because the accounts differ does not automatically make one false. In the story of Yahushua's birth, Luke has Mary and Joseph starting at Nazareth and travelling to Bethlehem in time for the birth before returning to Nazareth. Matthew starts later in the narrative. He starts with Yahushua's birth in Bethlehem. Then he fills in some details not found in Luke. He talks about the flight into Egypt to get away from Herod before the family returned to Nazareth. True. Uh, Kind of like biographers today. They choose to focus on different aspects of a person's life. Yes, the Gospel writers included different details, but the overall account is harmonious. One gospel writer has the saviour cleansing the temple at the beginning of his ministry, another at the end. The simple fact is, he cleansed the temple twice. (laughs) Yeah, another thing people ask though, and they can get quite aggressive in asking this one, Dave. How can Christianity be the only true way to Yah? It's not. As we've said before, each religion has some germ of truth. Yahweh has ensured that every belief system has some portion of truth so that those who are exposed to it can, by responding to it, be drawn into still greater truth. Now, the reality is, the more truth you know, the closer you draw to Yah. And as you draw closer, the more your beliefs will have in common with those who are also drawing close to Yah. He is the source of all truth. That's when you discover truths like John chapter 14, verse 6, where Yahushua says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's a good point to remember. We all start off at different points, but we are all in need of a saviour. You see, too many people envision the path to heaven as being one long road with the Father at the other end. A better way to picture it would be to see the Father as the hub at the centre of all, and we, like the spokes of a wheel, are scattered all around him, some closer, some further away. Now, if I'm on one side of that central hub with Yah in the middle, and your background, the beliefs with which you were raised, place you on the other side, I need to allow Yah the room to work with you, just as he is with me, and trust that... As we both respond to his drawing, we will eventually become united as one when we become one with him. Mm, That's a good way to look at it as well. Now, a couple of thoughts I've just had um, that I just want to toss out there. First, don't be afraid to say you don't know. Sometimes we can get cocky and think we have the answer to everything. If you don't know, say so. Don't try to bluff your way through it. Yeah, no, that's, that's good, actually. An intellectually honest person will respect an honest answer more than he'll respect a bluff. Mm. If you don't know, admit that you don't know. Promise to study it out, though, and get back to them with an answer. Uh, secondly, on my notes down here, we need to remember that it's not our job to convict, that it's the job of the spirit of Yah. We're Yah's spokesman. We say the words, but it's the divine spirit that does the convicting. Yeah, that was a lesson it took me a while to learn, you know. I used to think that if I could just come up with the right words, I'd convince someone by sheer force of argument, and it doesn't work that way. Mm. And I'm, I'm so glad. If, if, we're, if we're willing to say the words, we can leave the rest to Yah. Listen, we're out of time, but please keep sending us your questions at worldslastchance.com. Click on Contact Us, and we look forward to hearing from you soon. This is Jane Lamb with your daily promise from Yah's Word. 
Greg and Sean Stranigan are a healthy, active couple. Or, as Greg jokes, his wife likes to be shown love by going on hikes. So one morning, when Greg woke up with every muscle aching, it was cause for concern. There was no obvious reason for him to be in so much pain. The next day was even worse, so Greg made an appointment with his doctor. Neuromuscular disorders are always serious health issues, but doctors were unable to pinpoint the origin of Greg's symptoms. Possibilities range between multiple sclerosis, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or Lyme's disease. With the worry and uncertainty of Greg's failing health, Sean began claiming Psalm 41, verses 1 to 3 on his behalf. It says, Blessed is he who considers the poor. Yahweh will deliver him in time of trouble. Yahweh will preserve him and keep him alive, and he will be blessed on the earth. You will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. Yahweh will strengthen him on his bed of illness. You will sustain him on his sickbed. Not long after Sean began claiming these promises on behalf of her husband, Greg met with a neurosurgeon who diagnosed him with cervical stenosis, a condition in which the spinal canal starts to narrow. The surgeon was confident that he wouldn't have any trouble fixing the problem. The surgeon was leaving on vacation in two days and did not want to postpone the surgery until his return because Greg was in danger of being paralysed if he should fall or jar his neck in any way. The surgery was scheduled immediately. The next day, after a neurosurgery that lasted five hours, Greg felt so much better. He was released to go home that same day. The surgeon told him that due to the angle of the surgery, a neck brace wouldn't do him any good anyway, so just be careful to take it easy and refrain from any heavy lifting. To celebrate, Sean took Greg on an out-of-town getaway. After a pleasant hike to some waterfalls, the couple checked into their hotel, where Greg carried their luggage up three flights of stairs. After dinner, Greg's neck started to tighten. The intense muscle spasms would not let up. He told his wife it felt like he'd ripped a stitch. Sean looked, but all of the stitches were intact. What they didn't know was that Greg had ripped a stitch, an interior stitch. When he tried moving his right hand, he couldn't. Soon he couldn't move either hand or either leg and it became difficult to breathe. Sean quickly called emergency responders. Greg had been an ambulance driver and realised his situation was grave. He thought, If I'm going to die, it's going to be with praises on my lips. He began softly singing praise and worship songs. At the hospital, Greg sensed that he was in a large room, but couldn't turn his head to see. A soft voice came to his mind. Why haven't you prayed for yourself? Hmm, good question, Greg thought. His prayer was short but desperate. Help me, Lord. Suddenly he could feel sensation in his left hand. He could move it. Then his left leg. The ability moved next to his right side and he let everyone in the emergency room know he could move. As Greg was taken to emergency surgery, friends gathered in the waiting room to support and pray with Sean. One woman said, I believe Greg is going to be all right. Yah gave me this scripture and she shared Psalm 41 verses 1 to 3, the very same passage Sean had claimed on Greg's behalf when he was first diagnosed. During a surgery that lasted for more than four hours, doctors removed a blood clot more than seven centimetres in diameter that had been pressing on Greg's spinal cord. Afterward, the doctor told him, you should either be dead or paralysed. People just don't come back from something like that. Then, referring to Yah, he added, the big guy must not be done with you yet. If you need divine help, remember the promise in Psalm 41. Yahweh will deliver him in time of trouble. Yahweh will preserve him and keep him alive.
we've been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. As a parent, I'm in the position of being both a son and a father. And the older I get, the more I appreciate how my own parents raised me, which, you know, itself is a gift. A lot of parents have had to deliberately choose not to raise their kids the way they were raised. It takes a lot of wisdom to be able to be a better parent than what you experienced on the receiving end growing up. Mm, it really does, yeah. What in particular, Miles, do you appreciate about the way that your parents raised you? Uh, it, well, it might seem a bit odd, but in light of today's discussion, I think it's, it's very important that I'm, I'm very grateful for this. My parents, my mother in particular, made a concerted effort to raise us to be non-conformist, I would say. So how do you mean? So, so a lot of people would view that as being a bad thing. Well, <laughs> yeah. I have to admit, uh, there are a few times I think my father thought she was uh, taking a bit too far. But the overall gist of her parenting, their parenting, was to raise kids who didn't let other people's opinions influence them. Now, of course, this could be carried too far. Uh, we don't want to be sociopaths, of course, but they didn't want us to be controlled by what other people thought of us. So how did they go about doing that? What did this look like in your home growing up? Well... My sister wanted to study karate instead of ballet. My parents decided it was a good thing for any girl to be able to defend herself, of course, so they let her study karate, uh, even though all her friends were studying ballet. Um, they encouraged our interests, even if they were a bit unusual. So, for example, uh, I was always athletic, but I was more into cycling than football, you see, so they supported my interest in that. Mm. We're living at the end of time and we're facing the end of the world and it's not happening in the far distant future. It's happening in our day. And as parents, we aren't raising our kids to live out their lives on earth. We're raising them to live through to see Yahushua come or to be martyred for their faith. That makes how we're raising them, the decisions we make, the activities and our behaviours we allow are the utmost importance. Mm. Yeah, you put it that way, it's very, very solemn, isn't it? Yeah, and, and I really see it that way as well. Now, in that context, if we raise our kids that are all concerned with what other people think of them, how do we expect them to stand faithful when the entire world's against them? Yeah, now that is a good question. And in fact, I'm applying that to myself too. I think we all, to some degree, care what others think. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. But you're absolutely right. Of course, it can be taken too far. If we allow others' opinions to control or otherwise influence our behaviour now, mm. it will be what we're used to doing in the days ahead. You see, the mark of the beast is no joke. It will be the most stressful experience any of us have ever gone through. And you better believe Satan is going to bring that pressure to bear to try and compel the conscience. There's another aspect of this that we need to be aware of, and that is the shame and embarrassment of having someone make fun of us. In some ways, it's easier to stand firm for Yah when people are angry at you, but when you're faced with a sneer, a snicker, when, when someone's mocking you, yeah. mm, you know, that can be harder to take, can't it? Oh, it is. As an adult... I don't like to be made fun of at all. I really think that as parents of the last generation raising children who are members of the final generation, we need to consciously raise kids who are not afraid to be different, 
If we want them to put Yah's glory first in their lives, that's what it's going to take. I want to close today by sharing a quote that's made a real impact on my philosophy of parenting. It's really profound, and I do think that this will be a blessing to everyone else too. I've got it here, and it says, The greatest want of the world is the want of men. Men who will not be bought or sold. Men who in their innermost souls are true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. But such a character is not the result of accident. It is not due to special favours or endowments of providence. A noble character is the result of self-discipline, of the subjection of the lower to the higher nature, the surrender of self for the service of love to Yah and man. May Yah grant us wisdom and grace to be that in our own lives and be the godly influence on today's youth so that they too will want to be such people for him. Join us again tomorrow and until then remember... Yahweh loves you and he is safe to trust. If you have committed to worshipping Yahweh on his holy Sabbath, calculated by his loony solar calendar established at creation, World's Last Chance has just the computer app for you. The World's Last Chance Loony Solar Calendar Guide was designed to meet the needs of lunar Sabbatarians worldwide. The algorithms used are extremely accurate and were obtained from Her Majesty's Royal Nautical Almanac Office in Great Britain. With our custom-created calendar guide, you can print off a loony solar calendar with corresponding Gregorian dates or flip it around and print off a Gregorian calendar with corresponding loony solar dates. This is invaluable for calculating time off work. In addition, WLC's Looney Solar Calendar Guide provides a variety of astronomical information calculated for your specific area. You can learn the percentage of the moon illuminated, as well as sunrise and sunset times, and what time the moon rises and sets. Because the motions of the Moon are so accurate, they can be predicted with great accuracy. This allows you to calculate future lunations so that work and school obligations can be scheduled around Yah's holy days. Visit our website at worldslastchance.com and start using it today. You can access it online, download it to your device or even integrate it into your own website. The WLC Looney Solar Calendar Guide, a great resource for everyone committed to honouring Yahweh on His holy days. Thank you for listening to this episode on WLC Radio. We're living in very solemn times. The world is hovering on the brink of disaster. Catastrophic events will soon take place that will bring this age to a close and usher in the next. In His great mercy, Yahuwah has revealed through prophecy what the future holds. Revelation 8 foretells a series of events, each one worse than the last, that will devastate the earth. The world's food supplies will be decimated. Famine and its accompanying pestilence will result. The earth's fresh water supplies will also be affected. Revelation 9 reveals that demons will impersonate extraterrestrials. The terror and devastation of this so-called alien invasion will make people desperate for safety at any cost. The freedom to live and worship as the conscience dictates will become a thing of the past. Many lives will be lost during this series of events and when the mark of the beast is enforced, there will be martyrs. Each event prepares for the next crisis. In one long last call of mercy to repent, for Yahuwah is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
Shortly following the events described in Revelation 8 and 9, the seven last plagues will be poured out. These plagues and the earlier trumpets will wreak havoc on the earth and cause unprecedented destruction and misery. Isaiah 24 warns, quote, Behold, Yahuwah maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again." Unquote. For believers, however, there is hope. In describing the end of this age, Yahushua said in Luke 21 verse 28, quote, When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Unquote. Yes, the end will be traumatic. It's meant to be. Yahuwah wants to save every individual he can, so he allows this final climax to awaken souls. But the gospel of the kingdom of Yah is that, beyond the traumatic events of the near future, an eternity of bliss awaits all who accept Yah's gift of salvation. When Yahushua returns, all who've died trusting in the merits of the crucified and risen Savior will be raised back to life in the first resurrection. Yahushua will then set up Yah's kingdom on earth. He and the redeemed will reign jointly on the earth for the first thousand years of eternity. John saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. If you wish to join with the redeemed of all ages, living a life that measures with the life of Yahuwah, make the choice. Accept salvation today. You don't have to get yourself ready. The truth is, you can't. Neither can I. No one can. Come to Him just as you are. Don't wait until you've quit sinning. You're not going to get better through your own efforts. Accept Yahuwah's invitation to become a member of His eternal earthly kingdom. When you accept this precious invitation, Yahuwah will gift you with a brand new heart. In Ezekiel 36, verse 26, he declares, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Accepting this priceless gift is the only way for joining his kingdom. Come to Yahuwah just as you are. He's waiting with arms wide open eager to receive all who come to Him. You have been listening to WLC Radio. This programme, as well as past episodes of Radio WLC, are available for downloading on our website. These are great for sharing with friends and Bible studies. It is also a wonderful resource for those worshipping Yahuwah alone or at home. If you would like to listen to Radio WLC programmes, visit our website at worldslastchance.com. Click on the Radio WLC icon at the top right of the homepage. This will allow you to download the episodes in your preferred language. There are also articles and videos available in a variety of languages. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 93.30 kHz on the 31-metre band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Music